Hello and welcome everyone to a podcast on T-Distribution and T-Test. My name is uh, Michael Carsey. So the purpose of this podcast is to define T-Test in clinical practice as well as its use on um, US Assembly board questions. And then objectives within the podcast are to identify uses of the T-Test in biomedical questions, how to state a hypothesis for a statistical question, selecting the correct type of T-Test for a set of data, and also delineating the assumptions of the t-test in order to make sure that we're using the test correctly. So we come up with a problem of how we compare two sets of data. And on the left here you see a placebo group and a drug group. And you have the distribution with um, the mean shown here as a dot as well as the range of these variables. Um, but the question arises, how do we determine whether the drug that we're giving actually makes a real difference in the urine production of this particular set of patients? And as we add more patients, you'll start to see that you can create these normal distributions, these kinds of bell-shaped curves in both groups. And as they get, as the group size gets larger and larger, the bell-shaped curve becomes more and more apparent. So we can think of the problem of determining two different sets of data as finding some, some difference between sample means divided by the standard error of the difference of sample means. So in other words, looking at the means of the data and the ranges of the data, we can use those two, th two um, variables to try to determine whether giving a drug really makes a difference in this particular variable. So we come up with the concept of student's t-test. And this man here, William Seeley Gossett, was a worker for the Guinness uh, factory. And he was the creator of student's uh, t-test. And the history of this particular test has to do with he was working with, with small sets of data trying to determine which types of barley would help create the best type of beer. And what happened was somebody previously in the factory had um, sold, published some secrets of the factory and and had sold them off. So, so the company was actually very reluctant to publish any sort of information about production methods. And Gossett really argued with his, his managers and said that the T-test was something that wasn't going to make any impact, it wasn't selling any sort of secrets, and so they allowed him to publish it, but they uh, suggested that he used some eponym um, in order to not make any trouble with other workers at the factory. So hence the student's t-test, or a, a student of statistics, was was born. Now, the t-test, as we're going to get into it, is a very common type of statistical test. You can see here in two meta-analyses of, of articles from these two journals, the t-test uh, accounted for about 17% and 8% of their elementary statistical tests, which is which is a lot. The, the, these this test is very commonly used, and and as you'll see, it can be commonly used um, erroneously. So we should really start to understand how um, it is used in, in order for us to use it correctly. Now, this hypothesis testing using the t-test, the purpose is to compare the difference between two continuous variables with normal distributions, distributions that have means and standard deviations, and to determine whether these two distributions are truly different or different due to chance. Now, the t-distribution is similar to the z-distribution, um, which we'll get into a little bit. There are two types of t-test, that of the paired or dependent t-test, and that of the unpaired or pooled or independent t-test, all are the, the different ways of saying the same type of test. And you'll see that the t-test and the z-test have equivalent formulas, and the decision to use one test or another really depends on the sample size and the knowledge of the standard deviation. In t-test, we are dealing with small samples where the standard deviation is unknown. In z-test, we're dealing with population samples and the standard deviation is often known. So hypothesis formulation is an important part of using a t-test. We use a hypothesis in order to break down a statistical problem into one of just probabilities and really strip away any kind of language in the problem in order to make it a very simple mathematical question. And we formulate something called a null hypothesis, 
where we, use, we assume that there is no difference between the two groups that we're trying to compare, and we either try to reject or we fail to reject this null hypothesis. It is actually erroneous to say that a null hypothesis is accepted, because it would imply that we have absolute knowledge over the question at hand, whereas in reality we often don't, we're just comparing probabilities. The null hypothesis, again, strips down a problem just to probabilities that are calculated, and you should keep in mind that no absolute conclusions can ever be reached regarding statistical tests. There's always a risk of error. So if you ever see statistical tests and reports that two groups are statistically uh, different, this does not mean that they are truly different. It could have to do with sample size, and, and there could be other confounding variables. And so you should always keep in mind that we suggest that these two groups are different based on the probability that we've decided. So when we want to compare a one sample um, uh, two-tailed uh, null hypothesis, and we'll go into detail about what the tails mean, we write our null hypothesis like this, that, that the mean is equal to mu naught, or some stated mean. A two-sample, two-tailed null hypothesis is written as uh, mean 1 is equal to mean 2, or the difference between mean 1 and mean 2 is equal to 0. And these are the alternative hypotheses, or essentially what we're trying to prove. So how do we to determine whether to use a one-sided t-statistic or two-sided t-statistic? Well, the importance of knowing this is trying to figure out whether we are comparing um, the difference between the two groups and whether one group difference is greater than another group or less than another group. When we're trying to indicate directionality, we really use the one-sided t-statistic. Whereas when we have no idea of the directionality, we just try to state that two groups are different, we are unsure whether one group or the other is greater or less than the other, then we use the two-sided t-statistic. And we will use the tails as the cutoff point for when we reject the null hypothesis, when we can determine that there truly is a difference between the two groups. So here you can see in blue, anything that any sort of t-statistic that falls into these tails, we can then reject the null hypothesis, whereas t-statistics that fall anywhere else, we are unable to reject the null hypothesis. And for two-tail distributions, again, because we don't know the directionality, our t-statistic could be positive or negative number, and if it falls in the tails, we reject the null hypothesis. If it falls in the middle, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So when we try to use a one or two tail distribution, actually knowing the directionality of the difference is important because we can really cut down on the type one error when we select the one-sided t-test. However, in many times, in many situations, we have to use a two-sided t-statistic because we don't know what the difference will be between the two groups. And let's go into a little detail about what a t-distribution looks like. Well, starting with the z-distribution, we can see it's normally distributed in a Gaussian or bell-shaped curve. This has to do with populations, so the sample sizes that, that uh, formulate this sort of curve are very large. Uh, the standard deviation is known, and we use Greek letters such as mu and sigma to describe the mean and the standard deviation of this population. However, with the t-distribution, it is also normally distributed population, but it's a population subset. We're dealing with small sample sizes, oftentimes the population standard deviation is unknown. We use English letters such as X, X bar, and S to describe it. And as you can see, the T distribution really resembles a Z distribution, but it's smushed down as if somebody had pushed down on the top of this distribution and flattened it around its side. We are basically implying that there is more uncertainty in this sort of distribution. And as you can see, when you have sample sizes that are you know, very small, such as less than 30, the distribution is much, much wider. As you start to have sample sizes that are uh, larger, the t distribution really tries to approximate the z distribution. And after a certain point when you're dealing with these, if you have beyond a certain sample size, some statisticians say 30, some come up with arbitrary numbers like 36, then we can really start using a z distribution. More points about the t distribution are that the mean of this theoretical distribution is zero, and that this this there's symmetry about the mean. 
The variance is greater than 1, but approaches 1 as the sample size increases, hence it approaches a normal distribution as the sample size increases. These tails go out until infinity, positive infinity, and negative infinity. That's something to keep in mind. Um, we discussed the less peaked center and the thicker tails compared to the Z distribution. There are various T distributions. There's more than just one, and these are determined based on something that Goss had termed the degrees of freedom, which is his just terminology having to do with as you have smaller sample sizes, you have much wider distributions. And the distributions approach the Z distribution when the sample sizes start to get larger and larger. And the confidence intervals for T distribution, because these tails are wider, are going to be much larger than the confidence intervals of a Z distribution. There's more uncertainty in a T distribution. One thing to also keep in mind is that with a normal distribution, when we determine that within two standard deviations are 95% uh, of our sample, we also can conclude the same thing with a T distribution. 95% of our samples fall within um, approximately two standard deviations. But you can see that it's, it's a little bit less than two standard deviations for the Z distribution, whereas it's a little bit more than two standard deviations for the T distribution, meaning that our critical statistic is much wider with our T distribution in this case when we have more uncertainty in the samples that we're dealing with. So one of the questions that often comes up in the USMLE test is this use of standard deviation and mean, and here's an example of one. A large study of blood pressures in patients with hypertension are made with a systolic mean of 145 millimeters of mercury and standard deviation of 10 millimeters of mercury. Where do 95% of all systolic blood pressures range from? And you have various answers, A, 135 to 155, B, 130 to 150, C, 125 to 165, D, 140 and 170, and E, 140 to 160. The correct answer here is C. 125 to 165. If you look at how we do this kind of calculation, we know that within two standard deviations, 95% of our sample will lie. And what we were dealing with with this particular question was a very large sample, so hence a Z distribution. So you can calculate 145 plus or minus two times the standard deviation equals our range, 125 to 165. Keep in mind that 68% of all values in a distribution fall between one standard deviation, 95% fall between two standard deviations, 99.9% .9 fall within three standard deviations. The USMLE test will oftentimes ask you to calculate these sorts of ranges, and you kind of need to know how much of a distribution falls between these standard deviations. I've not seen questions where they, we, they trick you with small sample sizes and whether you have to determine whether you're using a Z distribution or T distribution. Instead, they try to make sure that you understand this concept here. So how do we exactly read a T table? I think we should go through the um, mechanics of using the T test so we can understand how it is that we get our critical statistic and determine whether a uh, particular uh, study is significant or not. And then as you get more comfortable with the t-test, you really use computer software to rapidly generate the answers that you're looking for. So that being said, if we're trying to determine the critical statistic for a two-tailed distribution, we have to calculate what t percentile to look at. And this table here is what we're going to use. So say, for example, we're looking for the, we set our critical value to be 0.05, we you know, put alpha 0.05 into the formula, and we get this number here, 0.975. And in this distribution, you'll see that the critical statistic is, is listed here, and the, um, the, the table basically has calculated the particular critical statistic for where everything left to that number equals the percentile shown here in the subscript. So if we're looking at the 0.975 uh, critical value. Uh, we'll look at it here and go down the list and find what our degrees of freedom are for a particular sample and determine which particular critical statistic we're looking For a one-tailed distribution, you should keep in mind that we use this particular formula, 1 minus alpha. We are not 
and breaking up the alpha into two different tails, it's just going into one tail. So hence, 1 minus 0.05 equals 0.95, and we will use this particular range of critical values. Okay. So now we go into how to use a single sample t-test. Now this type of t-test is used when you're trying to compare a particular group to a known mean using the t-distribution. It's used with small sample sizes, but more importantly, it's used when the population standard deviation is unknown. The degrees of freedom for this particular test are n minus 1. An example would be trying to compare a new mean from a new set of data to a value in a database or some sort of published article. And we use this formula here, x bar minus mu divided by s or standard deviation divided by square root of n. And then x bar is the mean of the new set of data that you're trying to compare to mu or the known mean. And this is the standard deviation of your sample and the number of samples with that comprise that particular group. Um, the confidence interval is a concept we'll also go into, and the formula for that is here. x bar plus or minus the t, 1 minus 8 alpha divided by 2, times the standard deviation divided by square root of n. So here's an example of how we use this formula. A study was carried out to determine the effect of a certain disease on plasma potassium levels. Mean plasma potassium levels for 10 individuals with the disease was 3.4 milliequivalents per liter. The standard deviation for this sample of measurements was 0.5 milliliters, milliequivalents per liter. And the mean plasma potassium level for normal individuals is assumed to be 4.5 milliequivalents per liter. At the 0.01 level of significance, can it be concluded that the plasma potassium level is different for patients with the disease? Between what values of the 99% confidence interval do the true mean potassium, plasma potassium levels lie? So first what we do when we try to assess this problem is, is make a note of the values that we're given, and then we set up a null hypothesis. And in this case, we set up the null hypothesis that mu equals 4.5 or the mean plasma concentration that is given for normal individuals. The next thing we try to do is cal calculate all of our sample values and determine the um, standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, which is given here. And then the third thing we want to do is calculate the test statistic, where we basically put in all these numbers into our formula, and we calculate a test statistic of negative point, negative 6.9. What we need to do is make sure whether that, or determine whether that number is significant or not. And the way that we do that is we need to use the table. So what we do is we know that we're looking for a significance level at the 0.01 um, level, or alpha is equal to 0.01, and degrees of freedom equal the sample size of this distribution, n minus 1. Since we had 10 samples, our degrees of freedom are 9. And we're looking for a two-sided test statistic because we're not sure whether the sample means are going to be greater or lesser than what our um, mean that is given. So we use a two-tailed distribution, 1 minus 0.01 divided by 2 equals 0.995. And what you do is use a t-table, go to the 0.995 level, and go down to degrees of freedom of 9, and our critical, statistic, or critical t value here is 3.2498. So we know that this is a symmetric distribution, where we have negative 3.25 outlining the boundary of the lesser uh, tail, and point plus 3.25 outlining the boundary of the, po the, the right side, or positive tail. Since the, the t value that we calculated earlier was negative 6.9, and this falls within the tail, we can conclude that the, the t value falls in this rejection area, and we can reject the null hypothesis at the 0.01 level of significance, and thereby conclude that the plasma potassium level is truly different for patients with the disease. The next step is to calculate the confidence interval. And we use the formula which I've shown you earlier here, and we literally just plug in all of our numbers into this particular formula, and we get a range of numbers, 2.9 and 3.9. The way that we interpret this confidence interval is that we state 99%, we are 99% confident that the interval 2.9 to 3.9 covers the true mean plasma potassium level of patients with the disease.
confidence interval it essentially means that should we have taken a new set of data from an entirely new set of patients and done the study all over again, we would have we would be 99% confident that we would get a mean for those patients that would fall between this range shown here. And if you change the <clears throat> the confidence interval, if you make this the 95% confidence interval, you can essentially widen the confidence interval because you are implying that as you become less certain in your knowledge of the mean, the, the interval will be much wider. Okay, so let's go into another type of, of t-test, and this is the pair t-test. Now this type of t-test is used when you're dealing, obviously, with pairs. So these pairs are randomly selected from a single population and assigned to one or two treatments. Some examples can be twins, where each twin receives a different treatment, but also you can use self-pairing, where a particular individual has a measurement before or after some sort of intervention. You can also have a particular individual where maybe the right hand has some sort of measurement and the left hand has some sort of other measurement. Anything to deal with some sort of symmetry between our two samples. The advantage of doing a pair t-test is that it greatly eliminates variability between the two samples. I mean, twins are, are, are very uh, similar in their genetics and thereby we can really try to identify whether our treatment or intervention has any sort of effect. And the equations that we use for pair t-tests are shown here. You'll see that the, the t-statistic that we calculate is very similar to that for a single sample t-test. We have to do something where we calculate the pooled standard uh, deviation, which is shown here as SD, and we'll get into how we, we calculate this pooled standard deviation. The degrees of freedom are still n equals n minus 1, and the confidence interval is shown here, which is, again, very similar to that of a uh, single sample t-test. And we should start with um, an example so you can see how this works. One point that I want to make is that when you're dealing with a pair t-test, our null hypothesis is that the difference between the mean 1 and mean 2 is some difference d. Where, well, if we set the null hypothesis as um, the difference between these two is zero, we can literally eliminate that, that capital D from our equation and come up with a more simplified equation. So this is the same thing here when you have a difference of zero which you're trying to compare. So an example of how you use this for, uh, type of t-test is shown here. The efficacy of zinc sulfate was evaluated for improving the clinical outcome of geriatric patients with senile dementia. Each patient was weighed uh, prior to the start of the treatment period and again upon termination of the medication. See the table below. The investigator wished to determine if zinc sulfate affected the weight of these patients. So we can see here five patients, their before weight, and then after some intervention we have their after weight. So the first thing you do with the pair t-test is generate this sort of table. Then what you want to do is calculate the difference between these two groups. And in this case, I'm, I've just taken the after weight and subtracted it from the before weight to get these differences. Positive 3, negative 2, negative 4, negative 5, and negative 2. It is important to keep track of the signs, whether positive or negative, with these differences. The next thing we want to do is calculate the squares of each of these differences. So this eliminates the positive and negative signs, and we get positive values here. And we want to also take the sum of the differences and the sum of the differences squared. So the sum of the differences here is basically all these numbers added up, but keeping in mind the particular sign. And then the sum of the differences squared is all these numbers added up, and of course it has to be positive. So once we've done that, we can go on to the net other parts of the the test. We generate our null hypothesis that the, the difference between the two groups is zero. We calculate our sample values and, and the reason I had you look at that table first was because our pooled standard deviation utilizes many of the values that we just calculated. So the sum of the differences are negative 10 will get fed here as you can see sum of the differences is negative 10 the sum of differences squared, or 58, will get fed here. Sum of differences squared. The sample size, or n, 
is 5 in this case. So 5 gets fit where each of the ends are. And we calculate this pooled standard deviation shown here, 3.08. Then we can go on to calculate our t-statistic. We can enter negative 2 minus 0, or you could have just eliminated the big capital D, divided by our pooled standard deviation, divided by the square root of the sample size, or 5, and we calculate a t-statistic of negative 1.45. So we need to calculate what the critical value is. So alpha for this particular example was 0.05. The degrees of freedom were 5 minus 1 or 4. We put in our alpha value here. 1 minus uh, 0.05 divided by 2 is 0.975. And we go to our t table, go to the 0.97 interval, go down to degrees of freedom of 4, and we can find our critical statistic or 2.776. Again, there's a negative and a positive tail because we didn't know whether the difference in these two um, weights was going to be greater or lesser, so we just suggested they were different. And since our calculated value, negative 1.45, does not fall on the tail, it's it actually falls here in the, the middle part of our distribution, we can conclude that we are unable to reject the null hypothesis at the 0.05 level of significance, and we cannot conclude whether there is a statistically significant difference in the before and after weights for the patients receiving the medication. Now to calculate our confidence interval, we use the formula here. For the 99% confidence interval, we can enter in all of our numbers and go ahead and find our interval. And the way we interpret this interval is that we are 99% confident that this interval covers the true mean difference between the before and after weights. So if we were to do this trial again, getting a whole new set of patients, getting their before and after weights, and, and calculating a difference between, a mean difference between the two groups, we would be 99% confident that that mean would fall between negative 8.4 and 4.4. So the last thing, the last type of t-test to use is that of the unpaired t-test. And this is probably the most common type of t-test because we're dealing with two groups. Oftentimes in research studies, we're dealing with the control and experimental group. An intervention was done between the two. And the two groups are randomized. They're similar types of patients, but they're not twins. They're not... You know, similar in a particular way where we can use a pair t-test and instead an unpaired t-test is what we often use. So again it's comparison of independent random samples from respective populations. We use a, um, a t-test when the standard deviation is unknown. An example is a drug trial where patients were randomized to a treatment group or control group. Uh, the number of samples in our two groups can be different but uh, we should try to get a similar the number of patients between two groups as possible. The degrees of freedom are a little bit different than the paired and the single sample t-test and in this case the uh, sample size of one group plus the sample size of the second group minus two is used for determining the degrees of freedom. The equation we use is this that mean one minus mean 2 is divided by the pooled standard deviation times the square root of 1 divided by the sample size of the first group plus 1 divided by the sample size of the second group. Now the pooled standard deviation has a particular formula which you have no need to really memorize but we should we should comment on it um, a little bit and the confidence interval is shown here. The difference in the means x1 x bar 1 minus x bar 2 plus or minus which you can see our t-value times the pool, standard deviation times the sample sizes. So the pooled, uh, this pooled standard deviation is different based on whether we, we're dealing with um, samples that have an equal variance or an unequal variance. You'll see that the t-statistic is going to be similar between these two, two flavors of the unpaired t-test. But if we have two samples where there is an equal variance, we'll use this formula for the standard deviation. And if there's an unequal variance, we'll use this formula for the pooled uh, standard deviation. The confidence intervals are, again, it's the same. Now, the way that you actually determine whether to use one pooled standard deviation or another are a whole set of other statistical tests. 
that test for the quality of variance, such as Levine's test or Bennett's test or the F um, test. Each one has a different pro and con and a whole set of other formulas, which is not really important for this sort of lecture. Um, and often when you do these sorts of uh, t-tests on a, on a computer using statistical software, the software automatically calculate that for you and tell you whether you need to use an equal variance or unequal variance test. So just something to keep in mind. So we're going to just deal with the equal variance just to go through the mechanics of how this kind of test is done so you can understand it a little bit better. So an example of an unpaired t-test is shown here. In order to evaluate the difference in serum sodium levels between normotensive and newly diagnosed hypertensive patients not yet on a sodium controlled diet, the following data were obtained. For the normotensive patients, we have 15 patients with a mean uh, sodium of 144 milliequivalents per liter and standard deviation of 6.2 milliequivalents per liter. There were 12 hypertensive patients with a mean of 160 and standard deviation of 3.9. Now, had I not given you the actual means and I had just given you a list of numbers, these are things that you could probably calculate on your own. Using a alpha equals 0.1 level of significance, can it be concluded that there is a difference in sodium level for the normotensive and hypertensive groups? So what we try to do first is set up our null hypothesis that the mean of the first group is equal to the mean of the second group or that the difference in the means is zero. Our alternative hypothesis is that there is a difference between the two means. We list our our values and we try to calculate the pooled standard deviation and we're going to assume in this case that the variances were equal and and put in all of our values into the formula to calculate our pooled standard deviation shown here so the sample size of 11 goes here um, once it's calculated out the standard deviation from the group 3.9 squared goes here from the second group, we have the sample size n minus 1. So 15 minus 1 is 14, goes here, 6.2 squared here, and you know n1 plus n2 minus 2 goes into the denominator here. And we can calculate our pooled standard deviation as 5.3. The next step is to calculate the t statistic. And we plug in our numbers into our formula, shown here, and we calculate a t statistic of 2.05. Okay. So next we want to figure out what our critical value is. And we will use alpha of 0.01 as given in the question stem, degrees of freedom, n1 plus n2 minus 2 equal 25. We look up the 95th percentile because we put in uh, 1 minus 0.1 divided by 2, and we get t of 0.95. Look it up in the table for degrees of freedom of 25 and we get a critical, critical value of 1.70 and so we know that this is a two-tailed distribution so the, the curve is symmetric and we have a negative critical value and a positive critical value the, the test statistic that we calculated or, or 2.05 falls within the tail and hence we can reject the null hypothesis and conclude that at the 0.1 level of significance that the sodium levels for the normotensive and hypertensive groups are different. After we do that, we can go ahead and calculate our confidence interval. So we're going to calculate the 90% confidence interval, where alpha equal 0.1. We put in our numbers into our, our equation, and we get a range 12.05 to 19.5. And we can interpret this as we are 90% confident that the interval 12.5 and 19.5 covers the true difference in sodium levels between these groups. The hypertensive group has a mean sodium level at, of at least 12.5 milliequivalents higher than the normotensive group at alpha equals 0.05. Now, in terms of the USMLE, we're rarely, if ever, asked to go through the mechanics of a t-test. That's something that requires formulas and calculators and um, it requires more time than I think the test really lots for. Instead, the way that the questions on the USMLE ask about t-test is some sort of example that I've given you here, and mainly in terms of, of asking the student to know when it's appropriate to use a t-test. So for this particular question, 
A study of thyroid stimulating hormone TSH levels was made in two groups of patients receiving different thyroid replacement medication regimens. One uh, results demonstrated a mean TSH of 2.5 milli IU per mil in one group and 4.5 milli IU per mil in another group. What would be the best statistical test to compare the mean TSH levels? Would it be a two-sample Z test, a two-sample T test, analysis of variance of ORANOVA, chi-square test, or linear regression? And the answer in this case, obviously, is the two-sample T test. So how do we know what kind of test to use? Well, the two-sample T tests are commonly used in, in any sort of research study, but it's often used when we are using a null hypothesis and we don't know the standard deviation we do between the two groups. So oftentimes we're dealing with two small samples. The z-tests are used when we're evaluating populations, huge numbers from databases or census studies, or when you'd use a z-test. The analysis of variance is similar to a t-test and a z-test, but it's used when you are comparing greater than two continuous groups. A chi-square test is used when you're comparing proportions, such as gender or grade, um, and the linear regression is when you try to compare two continuous variables against each other. Had you not known what these other statistical tests were useful for, you could still probably get this question right by knowing that the t-test is commonly used, and by knowing when it's properly used, you can, you can look through the data and, and figure out when you need to select it as an answer. So one point I want to make is that t-tests, again, are commonly used. Uh, this is a study of 142 articles published in um, a meta-analysis in, in the journal Circulation, where it shows that 39% of the studies did not use statistics, and 34% used the t-test appropriately. And, and again, that ANOVA we just mentioned were, were used in another set of, of uh, samples. Um, they've used appropriate other statistical tests, but I want you to pay attention here where it shows that uh, approximately 27% of studies use the t-test incorrectly when comparing more than two groups. Um, and this is basically when the researchers had maybe greater than two groups, they might have had three or four groups, and they, and they sp just used the t-test to do a bunch of different tests against these groups to see if they were different. And that's, a, that's the wrong way of using the test. But one thing to keep in mind is that 20 years after this paper was published, and this was published in um, 1980. The incorrect use of the t-test is still quite common in the biomedical literature. So let's go into some of the assumptions of the t-test and discuss when we need to use it and when we need to use other tests or just be more conscious of what some of the, the drawbacks of the t-test are. So we assume that when we're using a t-test that we're dealing with normally distributed data. I showed you very early on, when you're trying to compare two groups and you increase the sample size in the two groups, you start to approach a more normally distributed population, and you saw that the t-distribution was a normally distributed population, so we need to have that sort of distribution between our samples. We can't deal with skewed data, because the test is not not very good for that kind of, of um, test. Now, should you have skewed data, you can you can do things to that data, such as taking the log of the data, multiplying by some sort of constant, or taking a square of all the data to really try to normalize the data, and then run your statistical test. That's something to keep in mind. We have to know that the variant. We have to know the variances between our two groups. And again, if we're dealing with equal variances versus unequal variances, those pooled standard deviations are different. And we have to use the correct test. You can also use a non-parametric test, which is kind of a, a more robust kind of test where you're dealing with medians instead of means, so it's more resistant to outliers and skewed data. Um, and we, when you deal with unequal sample sizes, this is something to keep in mind, that when you have small sample sizes, you can easily have skewed data, and you can have... Um, erroneous differences in your data that will come up as statistically significant but could simply be due to a problem with the data. One thing I want you to keep in mind is that the t-test is still quite robust for a statistical test even when you violate a lot of these assumptions but that is not to say that you should simply just plug and chug and go through and use a t-test without actually looking at your data and the most important way to 
figure out whether you're dealing with skewed data, just to visually graph it and, and take a look at it, either using some sort of a scatter plot or a box, um, box whisker plot. Some other assumptions of the t-test are something called the implicit factor, which is when data are not randomly distributed and they're somehow related. Well, we can't use a t-test then because we assume that our two different samples are independent from one another and we're trying to assess whether there's, there's a difference. Um, sample independence, again, the samples in the two groups depend on one another. We can't have any sort of confounding variable within the two groups. Uh, we want to really set up our two samples well before we use this sort of statistical test. And outliers. Outliers affect the mean values and the variances, and we should graph our data to try to figure out whether there's a problem in the spread of the data. So some other additional notes on t-tests are, are, is this concept of um, statistical significance versus practical significance. So when you calculate a p-value between two means and it comes out as significantly diff different, you should take a step back and ask yourself whether there's a clinical, clinically meaningful um, result between, between this um, difference. So say, for example, a novel antihypertensive drug is evaluated and shows a statistically significant reduction in treated groups by one millimeter of mercury compared to controls. Is the one millimeter of mercury really clinically useful to patient prognosis? You can generate a study and load it up with thousands and thousands of patients and generate statistically significant differences of very, very small amounts, but you have to take a step back and figure out whether that difference is something clinically meaningful or just something that the numbers came up as significant. The statistical tests are useful for evaluating clinical questions but the clinical knowledge and the clinical um, question that you're asking is it, it needs to be carefully thought out. So in conclusion, t-tests are commonly used to analyze whether two continuous variables with a normal distribution, those with means and standard deviation, are truly different or different due to chance. We use two t-tests with a t-distribution, and this t-distribution approaches a z-distribution as the degrees of freedom increase. T-tests are specifically used when the population standard deviation is unknown, hence we're dealing with very small sample sizes. The null hypotheses are ways to formulate statistical problems. In terms of probability questions, one-tailed t-tests are used when the direction of change is known, and two-tailed t-tests are used when the direction of change is unknown or unimportant. Several types of t-tests exist, that of the one-sample t-test, the paired or dependent t-test, the unpaired or independent t-test. And here are some summaries of the formulas that were used here. So the one sample t-test, the, the critical value is shown along with the confidence interval. You have the paired t-test where the critical value is determined, um, calculated here, along with the pooled standard deviation and the confidence intervals and degrees of freedom are shown here. And the unpaired or independent t-test, our t-statistic is calculated using this formula. The pooled standard deviations are calculated using one of either formula. When you're dealing with equal variances or unequal variances, you select which one to use appropriately. And the confidence interval is calculated using this formula with degrees of freedom shown here. So here's some references for figures that were used in this podcast. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.